I want you to get about 24 inches apart from the person next to you or someone near you, wherever possible. And I want you to face each other this morning. If you're listening to this message at home, just find someone at home, get about 24 inches apart and face each other. If you're driving down the road listening to this, prefer you not do that. Just keep driving. Okay, face each other. Okay, now I'm gonna count about 12 seconds and I want you to look each other dead in the eye and don't, don't miss, ready? Set, go. Eyeball to eyeball. Okay, good. For how many of you, how many of that was, how many for you was awkward? It's a little awkward. A little? little? Okay. We're going to talk today about face-to-face communication. I want you to turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 John. Go to Revelation and turn left. 2 John, verse 12. Or you can go to 3 John, verse 13, if you want. Same verse, both letters. 2 John, verse 12. Now, This is part of the What's the Difference sermon series, and we're looking at today the difference between texting and talking. Texting and talking. Now let me read this to you. I'm gonna start with verse five and six. The apostle John calls himself an elder, doesn't call himself by name because there's a lot of persecution in the church. He doesn't want to give away his identity, he calls himself the elder. And he's writing to the church, he calls the church the lady. And he says this, and now dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that you love one another. Can we repeat that? Love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard me from the beginning, this command is that you walk in love. I have much to write to you. This is the verse for this morning. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. All right, let's talk about texting. Texting uh, had its, uh, we're about 22 years into texting. Started in the, Uni- in the uh, United Kingdom by a man there by the name of Neil Papworth. This is, he did text on his cell phone. He used his computer and he texted two words. Merry Christmas was the first text 22 years ago. 10 years later in 2002, there were 250 billion texts flying around. In 2006, the advent of Twitter debuted and in 2007, Texting actually surpassed calling as a means of communication. In 2010, texting peaked out at 6.1 trillion texts. Now, in 2012, 18 to 29 year olds, 18 to 29 year olds average 88 texts a day. I'll say that again. 18 to 29 year olds in 2012 averaged 88 texts a day and it's rising from that point. 88 texts compared to 17 phone calls on average. Until parents got a hold of understanding what their kids were doing to them with their data plans, texting was just outrageous. All right, let's look at the upside of texting in this millennial generation. There are some upsides. It actually increases your phonology. In other words, your understanding of phonetics and the sound of words. It has an advantage to it because you phonetically text. So for for children or even adults that are challenged with phonetics, it helps in that regard from a learning standpoint. It does increase reading, I'll say that. For those who don't read at all, if you have 88 texts a day, you're bound to have hopefully read what it is you send. So it does increase the, the advent of reading and has a higher frequency of communication. So we're communicating more frequently because of texting and we're phonetically and reading, or increasing our phonetics and we're increasing our reading. So that's that. The downside of texting. When you take a child or an adult 
and you begin to text over and over and over and over, you begin to, I don't know, for lack of a better word, cut neurological pathways in the brain. We begin to get accustomed to doing things a certain way, and that becomes our default physiologically within the brain. These neural pathways become kind of the way by which information travels. We get accustomed to that. Dr. Shirley Turkle of MIT said that face, uh, face-to-face conversations, face-to-face conversations help us think and reason. It help us re- self-reflect, help us understand who we are in relation to other people when we're doing it face-to-face. They understand, they help us to understand self-reliance. That's face-to-face communication. It also helps us to understand both sympathy and empathy. These are things we don't get when we text. When I have a f- face-to-face conversation with you, I'm gonna feel, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna look at the muscles in your face, I'm gonna look at what your expressions are, your body language, I'm gonna get an idea where you're coming from. I'm either going to be sympathizing with you or empathizing with you or disagreeing with you, whatever it is, but face-to-face communication allows us a lot of more forms of uh, communication than just texting. Psychologists are concerned that the social skills of an entire generation will not fully develop. The inability to read facial expressions, only uh, replaced by emojis, is just not getting it done. Lessons about the ability to understand and catalog emotions are not taking place. Lessons about emotional intelligence are not taking place. And for the most part, in case you haven't noticed, that we have a whole world with very poor phone etiquette. We don't know how to interact with one another verbally on the telephone. And too much texting, it really just amounts to hiding in plain sight. Now, I'm not one of these religious zealots up here saying you shouldn't be texting, it's not godly, that's ridiculous. Texting has a great use to it. It's, it's a great form of communication, it's very effective. It, it allows us to do much more things, touch base much more often. Uh, but it also, on the downside, inherent to a text is this expectation that someone's supposed to be available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Like you're supposed to text right back. Dealing with contractors now, I had a couple conversations recently. They don't get text. Trying to send a guy a picture of my, of my kitchen. We're wanting to do some things in the kitchen. He goes, well, I don't get text. Well, I know why he doesn't get text. Because crazy people that hire contractors want to text him on Saturday and Sunday. He didn't want any part of that. Of course, I wouldn't be one of those. But it's invasive, and it crosses boundaries. So texting can be very good, but like most anything else, if if abused, can be not so good. Now, there are primary, secondary, and supplemental ways of communicating with each other, as you know. And face-to-face, I think, is becoming less and less the means by which we communicate with one another. I wonder if I asked how many of you could tell me what color the eyes of the, are of the person that you were looking at for 12 seconds, if you could tell me. I wonder if you could tell me what that person was feeling and how awkward they felt or, or how comfortable they felt. Well, there is the verbal face-to-face, but secondary to that, of course, is the written word. How many of you ladies were snagged by the guy you married because of a love letter? Raise your hand. It was part of the process that really got you. Nice. Nice. Well, what, they don't have those anymore, sorry. If you're trying to snag a woman in this culture, write a love letter. You've got to find out what everybody else is doing and don't do it. This text thing ain't getting it, man. You've got to come down deep from the heart, and you've got to expose and be vulnerable to these women nowadays. You've got to tell them. You've got to sweep them off their feet. There's no romance anymore. People are texting when they date. They don't even date. They text. Then they talk. Then they Facebook. Then they Twitter. It's like 12 different social media criteria before maybe they have a face-to-face conversation. It's ridiculous. What about romance? What about gut level I gotta have you? What about you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life? What about I I miss you, I long for you? John Adams wrote more letters to his wife when he was president and secretary of state than any other person had any business doing. He loved his wife. He missed his wife. He communicated. When he couldn't communicate face-to-face, he wrote it down. The New Testament is a love letter. It's God's love letter. Another way of communicating, of course, in in writing is a letter, a love letter, and a legal document. The New Testament is both a love letter and a legal document. Jesus Christ, being of sound mind, bequeathed to us eternal life through his death, burial, and resurrection and the shedding of his blood. It's called a testament. The last will and testament of Jesus Christ is that you can have eternal life in his name. 
If that's what's been left in your will, that's what you can inherit. You don't want to inherit that, you don't have to. You want to resist that, go ahead. You're on your own. You'll have eternal life, you'll just be spending it in an ulterior location. The last will and testament, legal documents, love letters, notes, notes and, notes and lockers. How many people put notes in kids' lockers when you were going through school? I did that all the time. I was such a wimp. I just put my, put my note in there. Maybe she'd get back to me. I put my locker number on there and see if I got any mail the next day. But here we are in an age of texting, Twitter, Instagram, and emails. The single worst way a human being can communicate with another of anything of any meaning of substance whatsoever. Texting is a great way to miscommunicate how you feel and misinterpret what other people mean. I got a couple examples here. Let's take a look at them. <clears throat> Just watch the news, Weatherman says, to prepare for flamingos this weekend. Oh, God, no, anything but flamingos. Ha, huh, no, I meant flooding. This phone is so silly. That's a relief. I was unsure how to prepare for the bird invasion. <laughs> Your mom and I are going to divorce next month. What? Why? Call me, please. Oh, sorry, I wrote Disney and this phone changed it. We are going to Disney. <laughs> I get on the rest of the elders sometimes. They want to resolve issues by, you know, email and what's, it's just a, it's an accident waiting to happen. Why? Well, they're problematic because we don't know the tone of what's being said. You don't understand the tone. Someone could be angry. They could be heavy, sad, lonely, bored, agitated. Empathetic, pathetic, it's just you don't know. So you get these words and you have to kind of have to, well, I'll just let me guess what these people are feeling at the, at the moment as you're driving down the road, pulling off to look at a text. You go, I don't know if that person hates me, loves me, wants to kill me, is behind me, tailgating me. I don't know what. It's just a word. I can't tell what they're feeling. And they throw in some kind of colon and a half of parentheses. You're supposed to figure this all out. It's ridiculous. Not only do you not know the tone, you don't know the context. You don't know if you're sending a, meeting, a text to someone who's in the throes of a, of a meeting, a sensitive meeting. I get texts sometimes from people, I'm, I'm sitting there talking about the sexual abuse when they were 10, and here comes this emoji, and I'm supposed to, what? What is this? You don't understand what's going on. You gotta know context. You gotta know if someone's in a fog, in a movie, in a doctor's office, if they're arguing with you, they're exhausted. You know, timing is everything in the world today. If you wanna resolve something with someone, timing is so crucial because people are so fr frenetic and so frantic, so busy, so doing everything. And then, or some people are doing nothing and they're the worst because then they wanna text you all afternoon long like you're their form of entertainment now. I'm gonna text this person. If you see people walking around with casts on their thumbs, they over text, they're verbose, they need to lighten up, they need to pick up the phone, maybe have a cup of coffee with another human being. Think about that. Timing is everything. You can't ambush people. And two people texting without any clue of what context you're texting in is a nightmare waiting to happen. Let me read the verse to you again. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit and talk. Talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. Let's talk about these phrases. Visit you and talk with you. One of my favorite uh, uh, verses that I use uh, during the day when Mel and I, Melanie and I need to get together is figure out you know, how far behind I am or what has to be done or who has to be called or who has to be visited. I'll say to her, come, let us reason together. Isaiah 118. There's something to be said for this verse. Come, let us reason together. Not let me reason with you or you with me. We're gonna reason together. I'm not gonna talk at you, I'm gonna talk with you. You're gonna talk back to me. You're gonna tell me that what I'm asking you to do is not realistic. That's with, not at. So our communication needs to be set up for success. The first thing we need to do is talk with one another. Come let us reason together. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the people in Rome first. He'd never met them before, had never seen them, never visited them. He says, I long to come and see you. I want to visit with you. I want you to know me and me know you. I want to talk with you. That's what that was all about. So are you in relationship with people you're talking with face, face to face? Let me give you some tips. Well, controversially speaking, Albert Maharabian in 1972 came up with a study. Here's what he said. 55% of people 
uh, talk with their face, 38% with their words, and 7%, or 55% nonverbal, and then 38% voice. Now, nonverbal communication is everything. You see how animated I am on a Sunday morning? I see you guys drifting off. I got to come over here to this side. I got to wake you people up. I got to come over here and give somebody a shot in the arm. That's part of it. Nonverbal communication is huge. Jesus and Peter were reinstated on the seashore because they met face to face. Now, when you can't meet face to face, you need someone to facilitate that. The church, the Bible, they have ways of doing this. So face to face communication is of paramount importance to talk with one another. Here's a, here's a couple of tips for you. For you married couples, you want to get everything ironed out so Friday night when you come to the marriage thing, you have no issues between you, and you come out really smelling like a rose. You, you leave Friday and go, well, that really wasn't for us. We resolved everything Thursday. Not like anything could come up again. You have to face one another. I noticed when I asked everybody here to face one another, you didn't do it. Some of you, like, turned this much. Ooh, ooh, you turned. You turned two degrees. Ooh, wow, you really got out there. So face one another. That's number one. I like to tell couples to find a place in the house where you have these conversations and it's a dedicated physical place in the house and you associate that place in the house with where you have those conversations. So that when you are in a different place in the house, you don't have those conversations because you're not in the right place. You see what I'm saying? Geography. Make an appointment and prepare to talk to one another in advance. Don't ambush one another. Again, tone, context. Give someone some lead time to prepare for a conversation that's gonna take place so you can get our thoughts straight, get our notes together, get our mind right, and figure out how that's gonna happen. Give someone a runway to prepare. Delay conversations where appropriate, but do not avoid them. There's appropriate time for conversations. We've been over this before. Have a stated purpose or goal for the conversation. You sit down and you say, okay, today we're gonna talk about X, and our goal is to resolve Y. And this is what we're trying to do. We're not trying to do anything else Just this, stop assuming, know when to call time out. If the conversation gets heated, you call time out, you walk away, you come back and you deal with it when you're settled down. Actively listen, take notes. Now people are taking notes on their cell phones nowadays. See, I have a conversation with my wife, I pull my cell phone out and I put notes on my cell phone. She thinks I'm texting someone, which is a whole nother conversation, but I'm taking notes, you gotta take notes. How many of you started to lose your memory? or, or you can't remember if you have or not. Raise your hand. Okay, take notes. I have notes on my phone of conversations I've had. And I know, okay, what they were about. Ask for clarification if needed. Action steps for the dialogue. Don't just talk like at the end of the conversation and say, did we, did we reach our goal? Did we find a resolution? What are we gonna do now? We're gonna take some action. We're gonna, I'm gonna go do this. You're gonna go do this. We're gonna meet back. We're gonna talk about what happened. Let's, what are we gonna do? We had one of these at our house not long ago. We had, we had like five big major things. We're gonna, it's, I knew it was gonna take months to do, but we're working on our kitchen and we're working with the bank on this and we're doing this and we're going shopping every single hour of every day. Just, we're taking action steps, boom, 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 right? That's the way that works. And then you close the loop. So important to close the loop. Visit and talk with one another face to face so that our joy might be complete. By communicating, our incomplete joy might be complete or overflowing. When we communicate properly, our incomplete joy becomes complete joy. When we communicate the right way. Now, most of you here are uh, pretty fancy people, you know. You've been in the business world around, you know. This is, uh, you could get this out of uh, the one-minute manager back in the 70s or 80s. This is not rocket science. You've heard a lot of this. Many of you read leadership books on communication, and you're not hearing anything you haven't heard before, but do you actually think I came to church today to talk to you about texting versus talking? Did, I haven't told you anything you don't already know. Do you really think I came over here today to say, you know, texting is kind of impersonal, face-to-face is better. Let me, listen, I'm gonna insult your intelligence. You're bright people. Let me get to the real point. Do you, think about your life now. Think about your communication. Think about your walk with the Lord. Think about what you got on your plate. Think about your faith. Now here's a question for you. 
Do you text the Trinity? Or do you meet face to face? Is your relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit more leaning to divine Trinity tweets and cute emojis and texts? Or is your prayer life more of a face-to-face, transparent, empathetic sharing of emotions and frustrations and challenges and victories and gratitude? Is your prayer life within 114 characters? Or is it a lifestyle of a deep, intimate dependence upon a divine friend who longs to hear from you in any context, at any time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Are you a spiritual texter? Or are you a face-to-face meter? As long as we're here, Think, think, think. Slow down and think about your walk with Christ. Let's have a little checkup. Let's take some vital signs. Text, tweet, or face-to-face. Intimate, superficial. Can you spend time with the Lord and know how he feels? Jealous, frustrated, angry, patient, full of joy, text, tweet, or face-to-face. Is there anything going on in your life you haven't spent time talking with him about? Totally open? Or colon and a parenthesis. Superficial? Or do you have depth? Acquaintance? Intimate friend? There's a time to text the Lord. There's a time to talk. There's a time to listen. There's a time to be quiet. There's a time to be prostrate. Time on your knees. Time to dance. Time to celebrate. Time to sing. It's multifaceted. It's more multifaceted than the actual options you have on your phone. In fact, my friend, the most intimate of walks transcend human language, transcend the spelling of words, and they center in on the inexplicable, where only a tear can say what's really going on. remember years ago, <clears throat> my father called me and he, he said, we have a friend of mine I play golf with and he's just been diagnosed with cancer and we'd like for you to come and would you come and meet him and talk with him and pray with him? And, sure. Never met this man before in my life and I remember sitting out on his back deck and he was uh, sitting there in a pair of khakis and he had a button down shirt on and I introduced myself to him. We got to, you know, casual talk back and forth. I'm facing the guy, I'm looking at him in the eye. I can see, man, this guy doesn't know what's ahead. He's got, he's got hospice like four months down the road. This is serious business, this guy. He doesn't know the Lord from Adam's house yet. Anyway, I, after the end of the conversation, I, I said, you know, do you mind, you know? By the way, no one will ever turn this down. If they do, just forget it. You just waste your time anyway. Do you mind if I pray for you? Now, how many people go, heck no, are you kidding me? Back off, dude. No, what are you kidding me? I'm standing here, I'm dying of cancer. I have two or three months to live. Yeah, you can pray for me. Well, I, I scooted my chair over to him and took my hand there and I, I put it on his knee. He had a pair of khakis on like I do right now. I put a hand on his knee, right, like, like that. And he, he sort of put his hand on mine. He didn't know what to do. He didn't, he didn't know how to react to all that. So I just started praying up a storm, you know, I don't know. Closed my eyes, started praying, opened my eyes, and uh, his khakis in my hand got tears all over them. The, the khakis got these drops. I thought, my hand's wet. And I look at the man. 
Oh my gosh, the floodgates. The man, no, one, no one ever prayed for that guy. The first time it ever happened. He was like bewildered. He was like starstruck, didn't know what to do. Just blown away. I just left it at that. Went to see him in the hospital not long after and I met his wife. We talked about the fact that she was a, she was a Christian. She'd been following the Lord long before she, in their marriage. She kind of fell away, but she, you know, she's a believer. She says, my husband's not. My husband's not. Anyway, through a process of him being in and out of treatment, I keep praying for him and whatnot. One day I'm in my bedroom. And uh, I'm the only one in the house and uh, I got to praying for this guy. You ever had one of those burdens come on you? It's like it's the only thing that mattered at that moment. My body, I just started to shake. I was just shaking, trembling for this man's salvation. I was just calling out to the Lord. This guy's going, he's going to die, you know. This is huge. Just really, really shook me up. Anyway, every time I went to the hospital to visit the guy, he was in some sort of coma or out of consciousness or something, in and out, couldn't, couldn't, wasn't coherent. And I thought, man, this is not good. I kept praying for him. Anyway, I found out later there was a couple in Birmingham that knew this fella, and they were Christians, and uh, they got wind of the fact he was dying, and they felt this burden as they were praying for him to get in their car or truck, whatever it was, and drive to Atlanta to go see this man in the hospital. Well, don't you know it? They showed up in the hospital room, uh, at the very tail end of his life, and he was coherent. He shared the gospel with him, and he accepted the Lord. And I thought, you don't do that from a distance. You, you leave Birmingham, you go to the hospital. You go to the guy's back deck. You put your hand on him like it's your face to face, like you're a person and like he matters. And you don't text this kind of stuff. And you just, there it is. You don't just throw up a prayer. You, you do something. You touch somebody. You hug somebody. You cry with somebody. Face to face communication. Jesus went about teaching and preaching and healing every disease and sickness among the people. He didn't sit in Galilee and cast out prayers for the people in Judea. He walked 85 miles through rocky terrain and he got down there in the dirt and they spit in it and he made mud and he put it on the guy's eyes. He laid hands on people. He's face-to-face communicator. He's in the moment. Careful we don't absolve ourselves of ministry opportunities by texting our way through life, missing that personal, heartfelt ministry of presence with another person. Well, who do you think they asked to do the funeral for crying out loud? The guy had never been to church before in his life. They didn't have no pastor. Who do you think they're gonna ask? Let's get him to do it. We don't know, we just met him. Who do you think was at the funeral? All his golfing buddies who didn't know the Lord. You get up and you go to that deck and you pray with that man. That's the way it works. And let the Lord work with that. Texting, texting God. It doesn't work. There's a time and place for technology, but don't Instagram God for instant answers. We're on the go more than we're on our knees, you see. Interact with God, you text God for information. You pray to God for inspiration, and you speak, and you listen, you question, and you act. You act upon that conversation for transformation. You know, that Romans 12, early on, it says there, don't conform to the patterns of this world. Well, don't let your spiritual walk start to look like the patterns of this world. I don't think God wants 6.1 trillion text-type prayers. I think, it, I think he could settle for a, a number of them being that way, but in the end, I think he wants like a friendship. I no longer call you a servant, I call you friend. I want something intimate. I'm a father, you're a child, I want a relationship with you. Like a father gives a child something he wants because a child wants it, but he wants it and, and, and there's time spent there investing with one another. Do we visit and talk with the Lord? If, if your prayer is just one-sided, if your prayer is just me communicating like what it is I need and where it is I am and then I'm on my way and you drop like 400 characters on on heaven and then you're off doing your business. That's not prayer. Prayer is listening. Speaking to us through the word. 
Jesus had meals with people. He went to work where people worked. He, he, he had gave us this tapestry of creation to look at so, so that I could have a subject of conversation with him. And it's, man, look at this place that you made. Look at these mountains. Look at these glaciers. Look at this sea. Look at these animals. Look at these species. Look what you did. This, you're an artist. You can't text that. That's why you go hiking, to brag on what God made. That's why what you put in your body glorifies him and it takes care of this temple. We need to share with God in conversation, two-way conversation, what it is that we're grateful for. I'm grateful for my wife, I'm grateful for my family, all the things he created. I'm grateful for ourselves, uh, this church, I'm grateful. It's just not texting. It's a, it's a way of being. It's something you do, it's who you are. And this conversation goes on in trials. It goes on everywhere we are. Sometimes we have to give back to God what, what he gifted to us, like our time. He came up with time. I didn't come up with time. Did you come up with time? Who came up with time? God came up with time. Give him time. All we do is give back to God what he gave us. He gave me money, I give it back to him. He gives me time, I give it back to him. He gives my family, I bring them up to the, in prayer. That's the way it is. He gives you a gift, you use it. Gives you a Bible, you read it. Then you go share it with someone. Everything he gives you, you give away. And he gives right back. You and I are called to minister to people not out of our abundance, out of our overflow, you see. When our cup runneth over, who does it run over into? The world, the people, the people we're trying to minister to. We have to be deep enough and filled up enough that we are running over. That doesn't come through texting prayers. You see what I'm trying to tell you? Like, you gotta go a little deeper. There's a calling on this church that's gonna necessitate some depth. We gotta go deeper. I don't know what that means for you because I don't know what your walk looks like. Are we hearing him speak with us through the logo, logos, the written word, the preached word, the taught word, the shared word with one another? Even the rhema word, that's confirmed. Do we seek the essence of a face-to-face -face relationship with the Father? Listen to this verse. 1 Corinthians 13 and 12, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate or reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing joy and glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We, we contemplate face to face. We're pursuing. Even this morning when I asked you to face one another, some of you did the two degree turn. I'm asking you to face God this week. Not have him off over here in your west coast or your left coast I'm, talk, I'm talking about turn and face him. Face him. And, and by facing him, what I'm saying is, bring everything you got before him. You're not hiding anything. You bring your sin, your mistakes, your fear, your trepidation, your ignorance, your biblical illiteracy, your zeal, your passion, everything. You bring it all before him. Here I am, face to face. I've come to reflect on your glory and look at me. I fall short in so many ways, but what I like about it is I can come to you face to face. If you are the only one I can come to face to face, you're the only one I can not hide anything from. You're the only one I can truly be myself. It's difficult for some people to look another person in the eye. You can do that with God. And if you can do it with him, he'll get you to do it with others. Our conscience gets so clouded. We need that. We need that face time. Facebook is great. But get your face in the book, it's even better. That's how we hear, that's how we ante up. Gary Hewins here, in all my inabilities and in all my shortcomings, but I still love you and you love me, you died for this, here I am. You wanted to buy me, you bought me, I'm yours. Here I am, rattered, tattered, tired, frustrated sometimes, impatient at others, I, here I am, Lord, face to face. 
If I can't, I can't parcel out to God certain parts of my life that I want him to fix. I can't just throw up a text message. Thanks, I'm out. No, he, he died for something more than that. He died for a love relationship, not a distant acquaintance. Now, a lot of people have an issue here and they're gonna say, well, I don't know how to do that. You're a preacher, you're supposed to say that. I'll tell you, one of the best things I like about this church, when people refer to it, they never use my name. I've never heard anyone in this town say Gary Hewins Church. They say Community Bible Church. That's how they refer to this church. Community Bible Church. Community Bible, sometimes they say. CBC, say, bay, say, God, whatever they say. They never say my name. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. I don't want me in my walk to precede what the church is all about. Man, someone said, yeah, I'm going up to Gary Hewins church. I'd lay him flat out on the ground. Please don't put that on me. These people here, they seek God face to face. That might come up when I get to heaven. What did you do? What did you do, son? What did you do with those people? Told them the truth, yes, she did. Told them the way it is, yes, she did. You, I offended some people, yeah, you did. Then he's gonna say, so did my son. Did you love him? Yes. Did you call him to deep unto deep? Yes. Did you tell him there's more of me than they were experiencing? Yes. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Does our communication with the risen Lord foster a, quote, complete joy in us? The more face time with him, the more complete our joy and the better we're communicators we are with other people.